So Fiona will be moderating this evening, um, so I'll pass over to her. Yes, there you go. Thank you, Ethan. Master of Master of Ceremonies there. <laughs> well done. Um, thank you everyone for coming and thank you for all sitting at these cosy tables, which um, makes us COVID safe this evening. I'm not quite sure how the tables do, but I'm willing to accept the expert <laughs> advice on that. Um, I think it, consent obviously has um, not only been on everybody's minds, but certainly it's been in the media. And it's an issue that we have been grappling with, if not for um, years, probably decades. And more and more the notion of how we, um, I guess how we acknowledge consent, how we um, uh, explain consent, how we provide and give consent is something that, that hopefully laws will not be the answer. Hopefully this is actually far more about um, society, society, culture, equality. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from everyone this evening. I'm hoping that we'll, we'll open this up for a discussion um, because I think this is, this is something that we all need to talk about. And uh, just by way of, uh, of, of starting things off, um, so Miranda, who had been working, who's been working as an intern in our office, uh, has has set up a motion. Put I put a motion to the Parliament today or this week, to you know to push the government to recognise the need for relationship education, for sex education, for education that that actually talks about consent and it, and empowers and enables our young people with the tools and the language to to talk about these issues. And it's not, you know, as I'm looking around the room, I'm probably the oldest in the room, but I know how to spell fallopian tube. That was my <laughs> sex education. Um, I, that was what we talked about. And I know what a fallopian tube does. Um, I did not have, I did not have any knowledge of fellatio until I was probably 17, maybe 16. Okay, maybe a bit younger. But <laughs> I think for, for other people, um, we, we are, uh, we are um, you know, uh, online technology, the information that, that young people are receiving from every area uh, is really challenging, is really challenging and it's really challenging to young people. And so how we enable them to to find those pathways and, and how we enable them to find those pathways safely and with fun and pleasure along the way. And, and consent is so crucial to that. So while Miranda put, gave me a, a wonderful motion to put up, uh, we also saw in Parliament this week uh, the scandalisation of a politician for having consenting sex with an adult in the privacy, okay, of an office, so at the privacy of a room. And this was scandalised and what, what frustrated me was that it, conf it was conflated with some sort of inappropriate behaviour. That consensual sex was inappropriate where uh, that was not the issue. And when we conflate the two, we start making it really difficult to have conversations about how we say yes, what is right to say yes, how we say no, and, and certainly when we talk about sexual harassment and appropriate workplace activity, uh, workplace behaviour, how, how we deal with that. So I, I'm, we won't get anywhere near exploring that tonight, but I'm hoping that we will get to explore some of those, um, some of those topics. And um, I might, what I'd like to do to start with, and I know I probably haven't primed any of you to do this, but 60 seconds on on how how you what you think about consent and what you think we need to be um, what you think the most important issue for us in, in exploring consent or in the messages we should be giving tonight sure 
I'm Carmen, I'll go first, and I'd just also like to acknowledge the Barong people of the Kulin Nation and that we're on their lands that were never ceded sovereignty, and I'd like to acknowledge um, future leaders, people who are here that may be Indigenous, etc. <clears throat> um, so consent is um, a really interesting topic for me. When I was, um, a couple of years ago, I had a child who was in grade five at school, and he was sent a picture of a naked girl on a device from another kid. And he came to me and said, I've, oh, mum, I don't feel comfortable. Uh, someone sent me a picture, they sent me, and they, this girl is going to meet, this gorgeous blonde naked model is going to meet his friend with quite severe dyspraxia and a stutter in the local park. But I just thought, what a strange kind of situation I've had to do, I've had to parent my child and then some other children vicariously through my child. How do I do that well um, so that the kids around me are safe? So that they're, you know, what they're engaging in is good quality, consenting, healthy, happy sex. Um, and so it really became about, for me, exploring how do I do that in a way that's going to be useful and with good information. So the first thing I did is I went to the school and I said, so what's the sex education like that you're delivering to the kids? Because I'm doing some at home and I don't know if I'm hitting the mark or what I'm teaching. And I, I can tell you at that stage, I hadn't even considered or thought of consent or how I display it or how I enact it every day with my kids. And I wasn't doing a good job of enacting it well, but I like to think I was a good parent and I was really making a big mistake, major fail. So I went, when I went to the school and they said, oh, well, we kind of looked around and we didn't find anything. We might look at something next year. And I said, so nothing. That's gross. So then I contacted, I'm a bit of a bit of a bit dogged with an issue, so I contacted the education department. I said, what, what are you doing for sex? And they said, we've got this great link on the website and it takes you to the UK and their sex education, and you can look at that. But if you go to the UK, what you find is they've got the highest rates of teen pregnancy and STDs in all of the European <laughs> Union. So that was useless. So then I thought, well, why don't I ring up a researcher at Melbourne University and I'll say to them, you know, ask them a question. Now, anyone knows if you speak to, if you call a researcher, you can't get off the phone because they're so excited to share their research <laughs> with you. So an hour later, I thought, why don't I get this woman to come and speak to our school? Because, you know, it'd be great for other parents to hear this. And that's how I started on the path to finding out about how to teach my children about consent and so I had Cindy Darnell who I know you know Fiona who's amazing come and do the first session with the kids and she got all these lollies off the table and she set the kids in one area and parents in the other and she said okay yell out a word for a vagina and the kids are yelling out Cunt, and all sorts of stuff and she'd throw a lolly and they'd jump in the air and grab the lolly and everybody's laughing and all the adults are going this is so uncomfortable and it was, it was brilliant and when we left my son, who I, I think I'm woke, you know, I, I've lived in Brunswick for a long time, I thought I really had my shit down, and um, on the way home, my son, my 13-year-old turned to me and said, oh, that was really good, I didn't know you were allowed to laugh about sex, and I just went, oh, fuck, how terrible is that, how dreadful is that, I've been talking about sex, I've been talking about why you don't do it, don't let anybody touch your body, don't, 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 don't. And I had made my child feel like that I, my child was coming into the world as a teenager with this really strong feeling that sex was not fun, was not pleasure, was not great, it was very serious, very burdensome, very onerous. And I went, oh, I fucked up, that's really bad. So then we started to talk about consent. Because consent, of course, is what makes sex fun. Because everybody feels good. And when everybody feels good, it isn't onerous and burdensome and worrying. It's actually fantastic. And many of us probably have had, well, I hope everyone here has had great sexual experiences. For myself, it even, it, it sort of heightened my own personal sexual experiences because I was able to learn what consent was, but also I was able to talk to young people about consent, all of the children around me. And that meant asking if they, if I could come into their room and when they said no, even when it was just, can you come and empty the goddamn dishwasher? And they knew that what was asked, what I was asking. When I said, can I come in? And they said, no, I had to just let that go and say, okay, that's your space. It's your room. I get, you know, that's your consent. So my 17 year old's mate gave him a tattoo on his calf on the weekend, which as you can imagine was not awesome. <laughs> but he came home and said, but I consented and it's my body. And I said, okay, you win, fair enough. <laughs> and so anyway, that's a bit of background on me and my experience with consent. <laughs> Thanks, <Andrew. laughs> um, yeah, so I think for me in the kind of academic space, 
I've been really increasingly interested in the idea of consent and kind of moving beyond what we might call a binary of the yes and no and thinking about the ways in which we can think about sex and sexual communication. And I actually want to challenge a little bit of even just using the word consent has a set of connotations and ideas, often a legal connotation. And the other thing too is consent is used within other frameworks in medical and law and legal that has nothing to do with sex. And so my big thing is actually moving beyond consent to a language of how do we teach sexual communication and how do we do that in a way that recognizes that sex is sometimes messy, it can be filled with surprises and exploration, it may not always have everything discussed in advance, and how do we do that in a way that doesn't then lead to experience of violence, experiences of discomfort, of unwanted sex? How do we give young people, and I think adults as well, the tools to have these conversations in ways that are comfortable? And I don't think a lot of adults can do this, and I think I, I was speaking with a sex educator a while back, and she had this really great thing where she said, we're trying to teach young people that which we ourselves don't do well. <laughs> and I think, to me, that's so pivotable, pivotable, ugh. It's <laughs> too much wine already, I barely <laughs> drunk any. Um, because I think she's right. I think a lot of adults don't do consent or sexual communication well. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of parents are necessarily displaying that for their children and that's not and I'm not being negative either it's just a kind of reality like we separate parenting and sex and healthy sex and all of that kind of things and so I really am interested in thinking about well how do we how do we learn how to communicate our needs and wants and desires how do we do that in a way that takes into account a variety of ways of doing that whether it's nonverbal body whether it's direct communication how do we take into account um, neurodiversities that may require different ways of communicating sex and sexuality, how do we think about queer sex and the ways in which queer or kink and BDSM communities do it. So that's kind of where I'm at on the consent and that I actually want us to move a little bit beyond it and think about emotional skills, emotional teachings and how do we teach young people and adults to have these, have these conversations in ways that don't feel awkward or scary or uncomfortable, but also emphasize and recognize the fact that sexual violence is a real issue and, and that we need to address it. Amazing point. Uh, yeah, I, I would, uh, hi everyone. So my name's Luke. So I, I primarily work with people who have committed sexual offenses. So that's, that's kind of the perspective I'm bringing to this, I guess. Um, I, I would start by mirroring what Andrew is talking about, this idea that I think the word consent probably oversimplifies an incredibly complex phenomenon, phenomenon that occurs between a couple of people. And I think if we just look at the idea of consent, we, we, we're oversimplifying things. I've, 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 I would say I've never worked with an individual that's committed a sexual offence because they didn't understand that they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Like that that's, doesn't seem to be the reason no. people are committing offences. There's a myriad of reasons that I think we should be including in this conversation, but I think kind of to oversimplify it and say, how do we get people to understand consent, missing the mark slightly. I, one of the things that I kind of think about when I, when I think about this is the, the myriad of messages we get from, from other forms of society that go hand in hand with this message around consent. Right? So one of the things that often comes up in my mind is this idea that you watch so many romantic comedies and there's this idea, well, no means no, but if you persist it means yes and that's kind of adorable. <laughs> Right? Not that's creepy, that's adorable. Yeah? You, you see so many romantic comedies that someone is, is uh, rejected and rather than kind of accepting the rejection, moving on, persists and continues to kind of uh, pursue the relationship and everyone ends up really happy and it, it's, it's kind of this adorable message around how, how you're meant to date, right? how you're meant to pursue people. And I think what, whilst we're in a society where those messages are so prevalent, I, I find this to, to really become a, a, a nuanced consideration. I guess, yeah, I, I, for me it's around separating the, the cognitive understanding of the term consent to the practicalities of how it works in a sexual interaction and then more broadly separating that from the, the other messages that are damaging to young people and to people in society. Would be my comment. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Um, it, this has certainly made it a lot more complicated and, and I think you've, you've all really uh, well ex exhibited that. And I, and I, and I, and I love this idea. Like I, I was just thinking like, don't take no for an answer. 
when my mum would send me out mm. for going for jobs, like to, to knock on doors at restaurants and cafes and, you know, so it was about not taking no, so it was about that, you know, just keep trying and keep pushing and, um, and that will be in a rom-com that would be adorable. And, the, and yeah, consent to having a hip replacement or consent to having a vaccine is, is a very different notion to, to sexual consent. Um, so I, I think my first question was around too much controversy about consent, and I, but I actually think we're, we're asking the wrong question. And it's about how do we communicate, um, how, do, how do we communicate uh, that, I, I, how do we communicate that we can keep having, we can keep having intimate relationships, but when someone is, is not feeling comfortable. So it's almost like, how do you say no? Or how do you hear no, rather than how do you hear yes? Which I'm not sure that that's actually politically correct. And um, and I think I'd probably pose that different differently. But um, how, you know, is there an answer to this? And is there an answer to what what we should be saying to our kids about about consent? I think the big answer, it's, yeah, it's really complicated because I think until we get to a place where we can teach young people in a positive way that they can affirm their sexuality and what that looks like and providing the space to do that, we're never really going to be able to get them on, on a level of understanding consent because consent requires prior knowledge of what you're consenting to. So if you're in a sexual situation as a young person, mm. and, I, and I think about even my own experiences when I was younger, like you don't necessarily know what you're consenting to, and you might not know what it feels like and how you're going to react to it, and you can engage in a situation, have not consented and love it, or you can engage and it's really horrific and horrifying. And until we can help young people understand their bodies better and feel comfortable with themselves, and, and we can get rid of this kind of awful sex negative culture that we seem to have I don't know that we we can help with consent because consent kind of require it's like when you do informed consent informed means you already know what you're consenting to and in a sexual situation you might not necessarily unless you're sitting there all up in front and you discuss every little single thing that happens and you can still have situations and I've had that where I've had the discussions with partners we've talked about our boundaries and limits and then something weird still happened and you can't account for that and so I think we need to give young people tools to understand themselves and to navigate their bodies and then think about that in relation to communication, I think. Mm. Yeah, do you want to add? I'll, I'll, oh, I'll ask you something else, Luke. Oh, I don't get to talk to that one. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely can talk to that one. Um, I was just going to say, because I think it's really interesting how you say, what's the question? <coughs> you know, the, the question. Because when I started to run which at the Community Talk Sex, um, I ran it because I thought teens and kids would want to come, but all the parents lined up and lots of sex nurses came and lots of people who were teaching um, sex education came. And the first thing they said was, okay, how do we stop our kids sexting each other? You know, how do we stop them giving each other's head jobs just randomly? How do we stop it? And that, that was not the fucking question because why would you want to stop the most hormonal hepped up, absolutely desperate to touch each other, fucking generate, you know, that's that, that age group. They are wanting to have sex. You've got to tool them up. And it became really quickly to me, I realised that um, this idea of stopping was something that we're a bit obsessed with parents. And we kind of obsessed with that because we've got tiny babies and our first job is to protect our tiny babies from sexual predators. And there's, you know, this is a real media thing. It's, it's, a, it's a big pressure that you have on yourself the idea of somebody sexually assaulting or hurting a child is very distressing and reasonably so and then you've got this transition where all of a sudden you've got to introduce them to sex and that feels really stressful and you don't know what to do you're not I'm I certainly was never an academic in in the area of sex and you, as a parent you have no tools I, I got fuck all sex education I can't even spell fallopian juice <laughs> 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 and so it's actually quite a tricky word um and so I think that 
none of us have got good sex education. None of us talk about sex. When I started to tell people that I was running in it, when I was working in neuroscience research, I'd say to people at the Flory, I'm running these community talk sex, and they'd go, oh, okay, that's really uncomfortable. I, don't want to. I just came out to have a cup of tea in the tea room. <laughs> it's too heavy. And I'm like, why would that be too heavy? I, but the, I, most of the people in this office probably had sex last night. We can't talk about it. You're not allowed to talk about it. You're not allowed to bring it up. You're not allowed to normalise it. Normalising it is too problematic. There's too many layers. And that's fucked because I then, me, at the end of the line, here I am with my kids, two teenage boys who are growing up and I've got to send these boys out into the world to be decent human beings and I don't have any of the tools to do that. And so my conversations haven't been specifically about consent. They certainly have been about consent but not specifically. I've realised it has to be a much broader conversation about so many elements and so many things. And I've implemented some stuff with my kids that I've learnt from this journey. One of those things is I often say to my kids, and you may hate this, I don't know if you like it, Andrew, give me, give me feed, all the feedback you want, you are the expert. <laughs> but I've always said to my kids, don't just approach women that you don't know, like at the bus stop or anything like that, the library, don't go and talk to women you don't know, just wait till somebody introduces you or if they introduce themselves. because. I think women should be able to exist in the world not being hypersexualized all the time. And I think lots of young women, we all know that young women are not existing in the world not being hypersexualized. Um, I was a young woman, I was very hypersexualized. I've been very well trained by the patriarchy. Anybody freaking smiles at me anywhere, I straight away fucking smile back. Any creepy piece of shit goes, hi, I'll go, hi, I'll oh, die. You know, <laughs> training, just project it. But what ends up happening is I was sending my boys out into that world and I wanted to make sure they were the best people they could be. And I had to really work hard to frame that. And I don't know if they're the best people yet. I've done a lot of work on that, but I've had to bring in almost Austin-like values, you know, like I call them Jay and Austin values, don't go and talk to people on the, you know, on public transport, don't talk to and wait to introduce. Because I'm trying to put them into a world as, as people who live, you know, be decent. And then my son, you know, has a girlfriend, she's lovely. I hope that they're having consexual sex. We've talked all the time. I had a really interesting experience, which I probably shouldn't tell you because they'd be horrified, but I'm going to. Um, and I walked in on my son and his girlfriend having sex in the middle of the day, which my husband was furious about because he said, how come they get to fucking have sex in the middle of the day? But anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other story. So, um, and when I walked in, I um, was like, I am so incredibly sorry. I just wasn't thinking I was going to ask my son to do something. I didn't know his girlfriend was over yet. And and I quickly raced out of the room and I was so embarrassed and I just said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then my son came out and he said, can I speak to you please? And I said, oh, of course, I am so sorry. Like I have really abused your consent. You know, I, I've, you know, I've invaded your space. I've really, I just feel really ashamed. And he said, can you talk to my girlfriend? She is really mortified because she thinks you're, you're going to hate her now and kick her out of our house because she's... You know, I know, I know, I was nearly in tears. And so I went and got her, I said, please, could I speak to you? And she's like, oh, yes. And I said, I am so sorry. I, I, I broke your consent. I invaded your space. And she started crying. She said, I'm so embarrassed. I said, please don't be. But I thought, what a horrible thing that this young woman feels that none of the space around her when she was having sex was hers to own or to be in charge of. So how could she have consent in that space? And how can she, how can young women have consent in a space where that's the way that we frame sex? Anyway. Sorry if I, oh, do you want it back here? No, I want Luke to... Is there another question or? I can't speak to that. I would... would... <laughs> <laughs> Luke, I think it was hard to follow on from... Um, uh, Carmen's Parenting 101 there. Um, I, I wish Carmen was my previous boyfriend's mother's. Because um, that was not the response I got um, during those lunchtime interludes. Uh, but, but Luke, I think this, this does go to some of the work that, that you do. Um, and a, a, as you... You know, we, we keep talking about the, the fear of some of the clients that, that, that you deal with. And, and I just wonder if you wanted to comment on that because it, in some ways by the, what, we, what Andrew's been talking about, what Carmen's been talking about is actually having a greater understanding of sex, a greater understanding of pleasure. Like it, the understanding at, of, of those things enables us to know what we like and what we don't like and, and how to say, yeah, this is going great, or no, this is not going down a pathway that I like. And I, and I wonder if that's 
you know, is that something to prevent people from, um, you know, committing crimes that you're dealing with? Is that what they also need? Mm. Absolutely. I think there's a, a strong correlation between a healthy sexual life and a lack of sexual recidivism. So mm. that, that's, that's, that's not shown in the literature, so that absolutely sure. exists. Um, and, and to answer kind of more broadly, I think some of the overlap that exists with the work I do and the complexities around consent is this idea of, say, hypersexuality or sexual preoccupation. So uh, hypersexuality, sexual preoccupation, people who think about sex more often than average, whatever the average is, tends to be a predictor of sexual offending, tends to be a predictor of sexual recidivism once you've offended. Right? So if we take that as a construct and, and say, okay, this idea of hypersexuality or, or someone being overly sexualised or, or thinking about sex a lot contributes to the risk of someone sexually offending. Right? And, and when I think of that overlap and how, how it relates to consent, this idea comes to mind that when people are horny, they make stupid decisions, right? <laughs> they, they forget what they already know. They become solely focused on the object of their desire and tend to overlook signs that may be there. Right? And I think that, that, that that's an important element to it because you, you talk about you, you look at this conversation around, okay, this person didn't understand. Well, I, I guess from my experience, it's not that they don't understand, it's that when sexual arousal comes into the picture, it all goes out the window, right? And and that that to me is kind of the overlap of a significant risk factor yeah. plus something that, that really plays a part in this kind of complex interaction that we're considering, sexual communication to use your word, right? Um, the, the other thing I'd briefly talk to about that is, is this idea of normalising... Oh, no, sorry, I want to talk about something else before I get to that. So I really want to talk about this idea of kind of hypersexuality and what it does to an individual's bias. So for an individual who is hypersexual, who thinks about sex a lot, who doesn't fully comprehend what that means, assumes everyone else is thinking about sex yeah. all the time, mm. right? So what, how that plays out in interaction is someone smiles at them, they're aroused, they want you. They maybe go for a walk and someone holds their hand. Well, they clearly want to have sex because I do, and I don't really understand that that's not how everyone thinks all the time. Therefore, this person's kind of interested in me, right? So when we think about hypersexuality, there are a couple of things that plays out. When you become aroused, you kind of don't, don't think it's straight, but also you get to this idea, you tend to interpret ambiguous situations to have sexual intent from the other person. And that becomes kind of the issue, right? Because that's when all the justifications kick in. That's when all the kind of cognitive distortions that we talk about kick in. This person, no, they are interested in to me. They smiled at me. They didn't repulse when I suggested something, right? And it, it becomes this kind of really biased interpretation. So to, to come around and kind of talk about the way past that, and we kind of all seem to agree on this, to uh, talk more openly about these concepts, to be able to sit down and say, yeah, you, you tend to be sexually aroused a lot. Not everyone is, right? That's okay. And that type of conversation, to, to bring it all to the forefront, I would suggest is how we're going through it. So, I, I mean, how do we start those conversations? And, you know, Carmen, you're an excellent communicator and, and your family is um, the beneficiary of that, but, but not all parents are comfortable mm -hmm. in having those conversations with their pet with with their children so I know I mean the the motion that we put up to Parliament was that and I and I think it's um, is that that sex education or relationship education um, or uh, a respectful relationship education starts at an, at an early age and then I worry about my my sister who's a teacher like, how does she do that with the 30 boys in her year eight class um, at, without that actually being a, quite a difficult relationship for, for her to, to have? So, you know, is this something that we need to be outsourcing? Is this something that we need to be empowering parents? And, and when should we start doing this? I'll start with you, Andrew. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things there. So well, I'll start with parents. Even if you empower parents, some of the research that I've done, young people know they can go to their parents. They know they can talk to parents. Um, they don't want to. So it doesn't matter if you've got a parent who is super progressive and woke and, you know, sex positive 
like you could have a parent like Carmen, which by the way, I wish you were my mom. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and it still wouldn't be enough. Like they still might not be comfortable to go to you, regardless of that. And so. Empowering parents, I think, needs to be more around supporting parents to be accepting of young people's needs and, and helping young people navigate when they're asked, but also taking a step back like you, you've been doing. And like I think that's kind of a way to go with parents. And also helping parents be informed, because I think, so, like you were saying, so many parents didn't get a great sex ed. I didn't get a great sex I know my parents didn't get a great sex ed. Like, nobody got a good sex education, really. And I think empower, helping parents kind of work through that can actually benefit themselves as well. Because I think some of that too could be confronting. Like if they're being confronted with all these new ideas about sex education, it kind of causes them to kind of reflect back on their history and what they've done. And that can be really confronting and maybe a little distressing. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of, of, of support around that. It's, there's this assumption that parents, once you're a parent and you're an adult, that's it, you're fine. You don't need help, you don't need support, whatever, you're good. And that's not the case, right? A lot of a lot of parents are struggling. They, you know, they're really struggling with a lot of things. And so I think we need to support in that as well. In terms of school, a lot of the there's a lot of mixed research, but some of the research is suggesting that teachers are not the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that when young people are in these classes with teachers, if you don't have a good relationship with your teacher through, you know, maths or sciences, things that you're getting evaluated on and graded on. There's no way you're going to then have a good relationship with that teacher to feel comfortable enough to talk about sex, which is really stigmatized to begin with. So you've got that extra layer, and you've got the fact that you've got someone who's in a, a position of power and authority over you who can dictate your grades. That can be concerning. Um, you might be worried about getting into university, that sort of thing. So that's one issue. The second issue is with teachers. Teachers bring their own biases, and as you were saying, I think you were saying I'm losing track a little bit. Um, yeah, they like they need to be comfortable. They need to not bring in their biases. What if they don't agree with some of the ideas of positive sex, just that relationships and sexuality education? How do we navigate that? Um, and some of the research I've done too, a lot of the young um, people who experience menstruation were really struggling with sex ed with male teachers because they just could not talk about menstruation. They couldn't talk about the female body um, or the or a gender neutral body that has female body parts. Like, sorry, I'm using the wrong language, but. Like, they just couldn't, like, for people who experience menstruation, they, they weren't getting the support they needed. So you've got that additional issue as well. Like, it depends on your teacher. And then the third issue, I think, is that it assumes that young people are engaged in schools. In fact, you, you've got a whole group of kids who might not be engaged, who might not be going to school. They don't have a good home life, so they're not really engaged in school. If you get one or two days of sex ed, you might miss it. You might have skipped classes. You might not be listening. There's that issue. And then you've got the issue of trying to manage classrooms like, you know, a class of 30 boys. Some of the research suggests that boys don't feel safe in, all, in single gender classes. They actually feel safer to be vulnerable in a mixed gender class. But for young people who experience menstruation, they feel safer, or queer young men, they feel safer in a class where straight cis boys are not engaged because there's, a safe, there's issues of safety as well. So there's all of that issue. So to answer this, this will, that's been a big rambling. Um, Basically, I'm, I'm a big believer in outsourcing. I think bringing in people who are trained to teach in sex ed, who knows how to work with young people, who can create comfortable spaces, inclusive spaces, and also is that step removed from a position of authority or power, I think that's the way to go. But I also recognize that you need funding for that, you need resources to support that, and that's where a lot of schools um, may not have that access. And so that's why there's a want to train teachers up to do it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I, I, I guess I, I would only add a, a small thing. Um, what, what, can, can we consider both? If we want to normalise the conversation and, and outsource the conversation, but then also normalise talking about sex within school, within the classroom. I think one of the, one of the biggest issues that happened in, in my cohort in sex ed is the teachers kind of told us some information, but then the group of guys got together and were like, 
what a crock of shit, I've been banging all these girls, blah, 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 all this horrible language that you say, right? Mm. And it, it became around, like, I, I distinctly remember this, if you're not getting laid, then you don't have any self-worth, right? Mm. That, was, that, that was the clear message mm. within the cohort of guys. And, and we did have kind of reasonable people talking about it. So I think that the more openly you can kind of discuss it across multiple settings, whether it be school, whether it be home, whether it be kind of people coming in, I, I, yeah, I, I think I'm for broadening the horizon and saying, why not both? And I think, um, look, I, I know funding is an issue, but when you think about the effect of, um, of the effect that sex has on our lives and certainly the effect that um, you know, sexual harassment and certainly sexual assault has on our lives, then actually it's probably money well spent. And in, and in talking about respectful relationships in a more general perspective actually you know moves us far closer to gender equity moves us far closer to a whole bunch of issues and if you look at the the cost of gendered violence and and all those things that it's probably money well spent in outsourcing good good respectful relationships sexual education uh, one of the the reasons that we push for sex education and and certainly one of the reasons that that I've been an advocate for it is because kids are getting sex education from a whole bunch of other places. Like in Carmen's family, they get it very well, but in Still lots not. of places, hustler.com mm -hmm. is actually their go-to for sex education. In 1980, I think you mean yeah, porn hustler.com? <laughs> 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 hustler.com? <laughs> I mean, it took a little while for the little images to download, but they were pretty good when I got to see them. Um, but we, you know, as, as we know that, you know, people, people are, people are young, young people are, are getting to, uh, are, are seeing, and, uh, seeing a lot more sexually explicit material um, than, than they had in the past. And, and it's incredibly difficult to, to prevent that. And so it, do, do we embrace that? Do we embrace porn and say, well, porn is the answer and that kids could... Um, I don't know. think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't think anyone would agree with that, but... Um, so uh, that's not such a bad idea. Why not fix porn? Fix porn. And that yeah. that certainly um, make love not porn, well. make, make love not porn. Yeah, there, there's certainly ways. But I, I think maybe I'll, I'll go straight to to you, Luke. And I hate that this probably slightly gendered, but I, I think given your forensic psychology background, yeah. um, looking at you know we get told that you know porn is the theory, rape is the practice, and we get told that that children are looking at porn now, you know, okay, I showed my age with porn, do, with hustler.com and, um, you know, uh, I, I, that's not how, that, that is not my experience with sexually explicit material and I, um, I am a great defender of sexually explicit material for adults, but, but when, how do we prepare kids for the, the, the imagery that they are going to see? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I like the way you phrase it. The imagery they are, they are going to see, right? I think that it's it's a losing battle to try and say that children don't look at pornography. Um, broadly on that, I think if we start trying to ban things, the kids that are, who are at more risk of doing these behaviours are more likely to try and break the rules to watch it. So people that are more antisocial by disposition, right? If you ban it, it's just a red flag to the bulls. So I don't think we can go down that route. What, what, what I think the considered conversation about is, well, what, what are the damaging messages that exist within pornography? And then how do we subsequently have conversations to dispel the myths, right? Whether that is the simplest, you rock up as a pizza man and then someone wants to have sex with you. Or, or, or whether, whether it is this idea that people, <laughs> most people prefer violent sexual encounters, whether this idea that, that people uh, want to be dominated and that's a pretty fair assumption to make. Whatever the, whatever the messages are that exist within pornography, the, the, the fundamental one being that porn is often promoted or portrayed as a one-sided pleasurable experience 
right? That, that tends to be the, the dominant theme, not in all pornography, but certainly if you had to kind of pull apart one of the problematic ones. So I guess for me, the question's not how do we restrict actors to pornography because I, I, I see that as a losing battle. I think the more we try and restrict it, the kids that are at risk are going to want to see it more. Right? I think the question is how do we have conversations around pornography that dispel the myths that exist because that, that's what they are. Right? Yeah. There are myths that exist within pornography and trying to target those seems to be the, the more helpful approach or fruitful approach. Mm. Is that all right for a second? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I've actually got a really great response to this because one of my community talk sex, we had a porn actress who's called Madison Messina. I don't know if anyone knows it. An amazing young woman, adore her. And she um, was so integral to my community talk sex and also to my own learning on this issue. And one of the things that she would do in our talks, which was just amazing, was she, was, she would talk about porn as stunt work. So she would say, you know when you watch Star Wars and, you know, they're doing all this amazing stuff and there's all these weird creatures and all this sort of stuff, it's stunt work. When you're watching porn, it's stunt work. And she would, hilariously, in front of a school full of kids, position herself and say, so when I am bent over like this and he's behind me pounding, it's not pleasurable. He's actually, I know, in front of kids too, and my kids were very amused. He's hitting my ovaries. He's not actually giving me sexual pleasure, but that's the best cam camera angle. And the way that was delivered to the kids, I could see I re all, the pa all the parents in the room just went, ah, okay, porn is stunt work, that's true. And it was a really enlightening way to, to explain it to, to kids because I can't pack apart porn or work out, well, if my kids watch porn, is it going to develop, are they going to develop this or is this going to happen? I don't have that research, that data, it's not my area. And as a parent, I shouldn't have to be an expert in an area to teach my kids about it. So um, that was, that's been the angle that I've taken, that porn is stunt work because the reality is saying that we can't have porn, shutting kids down, it's not going to work and parents should never try and do that. Also, a lot of the sex education that the kids do get at school, it's poor, but it's also really heteronormative. So you've got a bunch of kids that just have nothing to access. They don't see themselves anywhere. And sometimes the only place they can go is porn. So if they can go and see that porn and see themselves reflected, there's some elements of health in that, I would suspect. I don't know, again, I'm not a researcher, but I, I think it's, you know, we know it's really unfair that a lot of kids don't have access to that. So that's my bottom line. I just go with, it's, it's porn just like Star Wars, which I'd love to be in Star Wars, I'm a nerd, I love it, um, is stuff work. <laughs> Your comment on that. I love it. I love the porn as star, star work. I'm going to use that. Um, <laughs> one of the, the things I think about when I think about porn is a lot of people go to porn as a bit of an excuse and say porn is the reason why we're having issues in our society. Yeah. The reality is sexual violence against women in particular and trans and gender diverse people has been existed long before we had technology. It's been there for centuries and you can trace it back, you know, all the way to ancient civilizations. So to say that porn is the issue, I think is really short-sighted yeah. um but i think thinking about the images and messages i think is really important because there are a lot of really problematic messages in porn um mm -hmm. it does tend to rely on very kind of you know kind of just frustratingly boring and in my opinion but also kind of usually violence towards women without any context around that you don't mm -hmm. really know what's happening you don't know if those women are engaging in it if they enjoy it you don't know where it's coming from you don't really know what the context is. Is it consensual and that sort of thing? And so I think with young people, it's good to kind of help start thinking about a porn literacy that enables mm -hmm. them to engage porn and enact it and hopefully critically evaluate it as well and find the porn that they might find useful. The other thing I want to say too, and I think that was a really important point that you made about for young, particularly for young queer people, um, it's really hard to find sex ed. And we're starting to see more of it now. But a lot of it also has traditionally been catered towards um, cis gay men, which has been great because we had that horrific you know, AIDS and HIV epidemic in the 1980s. We've got some really great innovations around supporting um, young trans and, and gay cis men, particularly around the use of PrEP and PEP, um, which I think is just fantastic and I love it. But there's still not that much available for young lesbian women. There's not enough mm. for pan people or for bisexual people. As a bi person myself, like I don't know if I've got a bi male partner, should I be taking PrEP? Should I take PEP? I've got no idea. Mm. And, and so I think there's still not enough sexual health resources. So I think porn can be a way to do that. And the other thing too with porn is that a lot of my young people looked to porn to find bodily diversity. Mm. 
And they did find it, particularly in the amateur categories. They were they were really worried about, are my nipples okay? Is, you know, is my penis look okay? Does my vagina look normal? I don't know what a normal vagina looks like. And porn became the only way in which they could find evidence of normality for their bodies and they just wanted reassurance and so sometimes porn wasn't about learning about sex it wasn't about pleasure it was like is my body the same as this person or this person oh look here's an amateur person who looks the same that I do so I must have a normal body and so I think that's you know I think it can be useful in that sense and I think I'm just thinking about your comment about fixing porn I'd be so hesitant to fix it because then it kind of assumes certain ideas of desire are normative. Can I clarify? I've been yeah. sitting here thinking I need to clarify. What I mean yeah. is all the things you're saying, Yeah. why not do that inside porn? Like, why not incentivize these kind of messages alongside porn? Yeah, I guess so that we're starting to see that with feminist porn and ethical porn. Um, but one of the challenges with that is that you have to pay for it so young people can't access it because if you haven't got a credit card, and like, I'm not going to put it on my parents' credit card as the, if I was a young person. I can't imagine. I can't gamble, though, without there being messages about healthy gambling. Yeah. Oh, so you're thinking more like the ads. You know, That's like, a really great point. You know, I like, like that a, idea. I why, don't know why... Why does this have to be outside of porn? Why, like if, if this is where young people are going, then can it be a destination for healthy examples as well? I like, look, I like that idea. Whether or not, like, Pornhub would do it, I don't know. <laughs> It's one of those things, right? Like, I love it. got an educative mm. section now. Oh, well, does it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I, I think, um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I agree with you. And, and, and in actual fact, like, I, I go back to the 90s, which around HIV, and um, oh, we. <laughs> this this was before Hustler Australia. That, that wasn't even invented then. Um, but this was in the early. The, the early video industry um, that, in, in fact, we, we got government funding to do um, HIV and safe sex programs on on videos. And I tried to, act, and, and we argued that when would be the best time to talk about safe sex? When someone was about to have sex. Yeah. Or when someone was thinking about sex and was thinking about having sex. So. The, the federal government at that time actually gave the, the Australian adult industry funding to run promos on the, at the beginning of their videos. And the US industry actually talked about their videos being about fantasy because there was not a lot of condom use and there still isn't a lot of condom use in, um, in, adult, uh, in adult films and in adult material and in porn that you see. Um, and in those days they actually used to have a doctor starting at the beginning saying, this is a fantasy. What a um, This <laughs> is not real. <laughs> and, and, I mean, and, and I think in some ways that's actually what we need to be telling our children. I mean, this is stunt work. This is this is not real sex. Imagine if just before you had scenes on Pornhub, you'd have just just a reminder that you were about to see a stunt. Yeah. Do not try this. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of goes, it, you know, and I, and I, I actually want to go on to talking about a, a, adult sex education because I, I, I think that some, in some of the preliminary comments that people have made, um, we, we know that, that we're all lacking in this. But just, just finishing off on, um, I think, on, on, on porn and, um, and, our, and our fear that that's where kids are, with that how we blame, we blame porn for this. So, how, you know, it, it, do we, is this about providing kids with explicit information around sex and pleasure um, so that they're not reliant on um, porn to get that information? Is that the plan? Uh, it's, it's... I don't... I, got, I just <laughs> sort of didn't quite get the question. Sorry. I get, I, I get the question. Yeah, you can, so we, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think that would be... like So with the research I've been doing... I've been doing some work with young men who are kind of in their 20s and 30s, and I've also done kind of previous research with young people on they're looking for sexual health information. And they've all said that they wish they had more information that gave them stuff about mechanics of sex. How do I pleasure someone? What does that look like? What can I do? How do I make someone feel good? How do I have sex safely? Not just in terms of safe sex like condom use, but like how do I thrust and not hurt her? Uh, for example, or how do I do a position that doesn't hurt? Or 
what like you know there was all these really interesting mechanics yeah. questions that were about safe sex but aren't covered in safe sex because when yeah. we talk about safe sex it's always contraception first and foremost mm -hmm. don't get pregnant and then we've only really just started to talk about STIs and bloodborne viruses and that's really it and so I do think something like that would be useful because a lot of the young people I've been talking to, they're going to places, not just porn, but like they're going to Reddit and asking questions about mm -hmm. how do I do this? What does this look like? What can I do to please my partner better? Or I hurt her doing this. I hurt her pelvis. How do we do this differently? Or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So I do think it could be really useful. Yeah, yeah. Should I, do yeah. I, I really agree. The, the, the point that I would add to that is I think that when we're talking about, in particular with young guys, so that's kind of my bias, that's what I work with, right, the, the, the contribute to problematic behaviours, the, the, the messages are, are really important, but then also pairing the message with something that's going to be palatable for them. Yeah. So what, what I tend to find to be successful is to talk about, not only this is kind of what you do, but this is what makes you a desirable partner, mm -hmm. this is what makes you a desirable person, right? This is how you have a mutually beneficial experience, which makes you more desirable to people. Right, so, so when we're talking about this, I agree with all the messages and the, and the uh, kind of, uh, I, I guess, how we do it, the what we do, the how we do it, and then how we pair that for an individual who's maybe not on board or thinking it's funny. For me, it, the, the, the link is, this is what makes you a desirable partner. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be a really important uh, message and, and bring people on board for the ride. I'm not just someone kind of lecturing, but I know actually, I want to be a desirable partner. Mm -hmm. You know, when we do the 10 sex talks, um, that's what, so what I do with the 10 sex talks when we, well, they're called community talk sex, but they're really about teenagers and sex, um, is I get people to text questions. And so that's all the kids in the room. And the kids ask the most fucking hardcore questions. And I just said to the panel, can you just see it through, which you'll have that experience in the um, But it's worth doing because you get a lot of trust from them. And then they start to ask real questions. And the real questions are always never about actually getting sex or anything like that. It's how do I make a relationship? How do I form a relationship? How do I get a girlfriend and how do I make her feel safe? How do I get a boyfriend? How do I do these things? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm same sex attracted. How do I go about finding another person? And that's really their real concern. So we do think they're all hepped up and ready to have sex, which they are, but I think they also, these are all the real issues. But it was interesting, after one of the first community talk sex that I did with my kids, after we, you know, talked about the laughter, the other question he asked me, which was also really profoundly interesting, was, what's the opposite of a head job? And I thought that was so interesting because he'd heard all the talk about a head job and he didn't know what the opposite of a head job was. So I took it to be cunnilingus. Oh. And just for everyone who looked confused then. Okay? <laughs> so you call that a head job still. Well, he said head job, okay. so I don't know. It's not, it's not the term I would use, but anyway, um, it sounds so basic. But um, anyway, so he said that, and so I, I thought that was really interesting because then I had the opportunity to say to him, you know, obviously it's extremely important that, that cunnilingus is very important if you would like to pleasure your partner, if that's something that they would want, you know, it's really good to know about that. But I thought that was really interesting because it's that a lot of times women's pleasure is often seen as the opposite too. And there's these discussions about what boys like in the schoolyard, but not about what girls can have, girls masturbating, all that sort of stuff. And they're often big shock discussions with parents that I run. Um, when we do the teen sex talks, a lot of parents are like, oh, so should we talk to girls about masturbation? And you're like, absolutely. How, and it was what you were saying before, if you, how do you know what you're consenting to if you don't know it, if you haven't tested things out in your own body? You know, and that's really frightening that those things are really missing. So it'd be great to see those in the sex ed. Um, <laughs> I... I don't know where I was going with what the opposite of head job was. <laughs> <laughs> More creative, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. I was also thinking. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just, just in, in the the last um, in the last little while, because this has been absolutely fascinating, and 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 thank you all, and um, and I and I sense that the the room has actually been pretty fascinated, but. Would, are there any questions or, or comments? Um, yes, you next, Emma, then right here. I kind of have a, um, two questions, if that's okay. okay. And See if you can speak into because you're close. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I kind of have a twofold question that perhaps are more like um, 
larger, not necessarily answerable, but I'd love your comments on. So um, the first is talking about, so I, I agree with your points about um, outsourcing to sex educators. My um, sister is also a teacher and, you know, has observed in herself and others, like, having not received a good ex sex education themselves and not being sex educators, that that's a difficult thing. Um, uh, I should preface as well, I volunteer for Scarleteam.com, um, which is a um, um, queer sex ed website that actually provides a lot of the resources that you're talking about, and I'll come back to my Great. second question there. But um, one of the things that Heather, the founder of Scarleteam, noted from her Australian contacts is... Can people hear in the back? Is that better? Uh, do I need to hold it closer? Is that better? Yeah. Is this better? It's not very um, So I'll preface this. Um, so Heather, who founded Scarleteam.com, noted that around the time that there was a safe school scandal that a lot of yeah. sex ed um, organisations in Australia mm -hmm. um, seem to have disappeared off the map, so you assume lost their funding. Yeah. So the question is, how do we enable experts to be able to do what they do when public opinion might mm -hmm. cause them to be defunded? Yeah. Um, and I guess my second question, just so I can hand back the mic, is around um, one thing I notice in my volunteering is like a lot of where resources exist that young people aren't finding them. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, they'll come to us on the boards or on text asking us questions and we direct them to articles or even um, I end up talking about resources that are on headspace.com and other places that they haven't found. So how do we help young people find the things that already exist as well? Mm. Um, okay, so to answer the first question, um, that safe schools thing really messed things up. It was devastating, and I was I work at Arches where and we ran that program, and it was just horrifying what we went through and what happened. And my heart kind of bleeds every time I hear about it and think about it because what the staff went through was just horrific. like it was horrific. We were getting bomb threats. It was just awful. Um, and thinking in that context. I haven't got an answer because you're right. I don't know how we do that when moral panic seem to really dictate where the funding goes and what that looks like. And the best answer I've got is, do we do it underground? <laughs> like, you know, do we offer a program that seems conservative at the onset and then are a bit cheeky and do something a little bit different? And that's not ethical and I'm very aware of that, but I don't, I don't know how else to, to address it because you're right, we had, Safe Schools was a great program it was a beautiful program. It was about supporting teachers to help them support LGBTIQ young people. And the reason it got pulled is because we added this really great stuff around trans and gender diverse and people just lost their shit about it, which is just horrific and horrifying. And so I'm thinking underground um, is the only answer. For the second one, you're right. Young people aren't finding those resources. And um, Dr. Jen Power and I, we've just got some funding from the Department of Health to actually do a study to look at how we improve that. So hopefully I'll have an answer for you in a year. <laughs> um, but what I do know from the last study did about sources of information, young people are going to Reddit. They're going to places like Snapchat on the Teen Vogue site. Um, and, and they're using Twitter. And the only other thing I guess I worry about is I just wonder about the language. Like I know for a lot of young queer young people, they might not understand that language or use it yet. Mm -hmm. So it's about how do we find a way to connect them that doesn't already assume that they know what it means to be gay or lesbian or trans or what have you, because it just might not be the language. You have to discover that language. Um, that's the only answer I have. Sorry, that's not very good. <laughs> Do you have a comment on this? Yeah. Not really, I'm sorry, no. I wish I did. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I do. don't have a useful answer. I've uh, unsurprisingly got a comment on this. Um, so I was just gonna say that I, um, it's about parents and parents need to educate each other. And when I started running the community talk sex, I got supported by Deb Ollis, who I know you know oh, well. Yeah. And she came to me and said, fantastic, don't worry about kids, just talk, talk to parents. Yeah. Um, because we got kids, but we don't have parents. And we can't deliver any programs if we don't have parents. And um, so I've, that's what I've been doing. And I've been encouraging other people to take up the model that I developed. Um, to put it into their schools and basically the model is it's just asking people like Andrew who are experts to come and sit on panels and deliver their outcomes of their research so the sneaky critical thinking exercises but they're also um, the idea is that it's making parents talk and think about sex in ways they wouldn't and kind of just normalizing the discussions about sex and um, and the room sometimes I've gotten up to 170 180 people to come and talk about porn all adults 
and the room will start talking about menstruation and you'll have women 40 and 50 years old crying and saying i didn't know menopause looked like this i didn't know. we know nothing about our bodies we're so disconnected um and it's terrifying so i i ask every person in the room if you've got kids or you think about having kids or you've got a connection to a school if you're interested in facilitating parent talks on sex let me know i'll help you run them because i think it really is about talking to parents so that we can get these good programs into schools and stop parents blocking them Oh, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll go back to you, Andrew, and then I'm going to go uh, out to Emma. But I, I, I think it's it's such an interesting point, and, and Safe Schools did just uh, it was so frightening the the attack on that. Yeah. But out of that was sort of a phoenix of respectful relationships, and there, and if we can, you know, rather than going underground. <laughs> going up there, up front, but but saying it's about respectful relationships. It's about teaching boys that they want to be good at sex, that they actually, you know, they want to they want to have good sex and and that and and they want to be respectful and healthy and that that brings in all of the issues that we can and then we can surreptitiously, if if need be, if it needs to be surreptitious bring in all of the stuff that Safe Schools was doing and, and all of that great work that Safe Schools was doing. I'm just going to go back. That's all right. I think we can shout. Yes. Yeah, actually, we can. Um, I almost got this. So, I guess the question is, we, as a community, as a society, only just started to understand what sex actually is. Yes. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole lot more women that feel that they've been sexually assaulted or had non-consexual sex or been raped mm -hmm. than there are men that feel that they have committed the crimes. And I'm, I'm not casting judgment mm -hmm. either way, mm -hmm. um, because those men don't have any idea that they had non-consexual consensual sex. That has, for some women, we've just shaken it off and we've just gone on with stuff and we thought, that's a bit gross, but, you know, we'll deal with it. But for other women, they've had real ongoing lifelong trauma as a result of this. So as a society, how do we deal with this socially and legally that we get the balance right when we, to acknowledge that there was no intent there necessarily, but the impact that this has had on some people has mm. been debilitating. And, and the law is pretty blunt. Yeah. A blunt instrument. Luke, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, I, I want to start by responding and saying that the, the impact of people being sexually abused is, is horrible on, on all accounts for everyone. There's some re really astounding research that says that a male who's abused between the age of 11 and 13 is up to 20 times more likely to go on to sexually abuse someone along with the myriad of other issues that, that are causing people's lives. So I, I absolutely kind of acknowledge the importance of, of the question. I think legally it's really, really tricky. I think that as it kind of stands, uh, my understanding is there needs to be a kind of firm no or, or someone's asleep or kind of unconscious to be able to be uh, prosecuted. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the solution. I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I think that if you start to move to the other end of the spectrum, you wear a kind of affirmative consent. Right? I'm, not, I'm not against affirmative consent by kind of definition, but this idea that there then becomes a hundred sexual acts that have occurred today that are against the law. right? And uh, as a society, we absolutely uh, need to move towards uh, respectful... Uh, ongoing kind of sexual relationships, but I don't think if the, the legalising it is the answer because I think all of a sudden you make uh, many people criminals who are yeah. engaging in behaviours that have been engaged in for a very long time. And I think that that, that becomes a kind of complex balance. Right? When, when we talk about perception, and this is often, mm. often something comes up, right? So the perception of the interaction. So that there's a common psychological process that occurs called justification that occurs uh, when men do things, even if they're somewhat aware that they shouldn't have done it. Right? And that justification can occur, and, and uh, I'll maybe talk about that a little bit more, but, but to kind of note that, that that's probably the psychological process that occurs for the male, this idea of justification, minimisation, etc., etc. Now, whenever I say that, the first thing people say to me is, well, we need to, we need to make them admit it and acknowledge it and move on, right? I, I give a caution to that. So there, there is no uh, correlation between denial, minimisation and ongoing recidivism or further offending. Even people that continue to rationalise, justify, minimise their behaviour go on to offend at the same rate as people that don't, right? 
And the, the way I understand this is I think that for some people, minimization serves as a protective mechanism. So as individuals, whenever we do something that we shouldn't do, we get into a state of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance occurs when something goes against our own value set, right? A couple of options is to justify it. For example, I don't know, I ate a full pizza for dinner last night, I'm trying to get fit, oh well I had a hard day. Right? Justification in that essence, right? So that's one of the options that we have at our disposal. The other option is to decide that, that we're, we align with the other value. And that's probably a more damaging process for us to go on. So whilst we, we don't want to we, we don't want to minimize the impact ever, we also want to be cautious of breaking through justifications, minimizations without providing the appropriate support to then handle the, the psychological impact of that. So I guess finding that balance is really tricky. Legally, I, I think it's almost an impossible task, to, to be really honest. But then from a societal perspective, being able to balance both the, the, the impact of the person who's been abused, but then how do we not make this person who's abused more likely to abuse someone else? That, that, that also becomes a kind of important question. So I don't know if I directly answered, but they're, they're my general thoughts. Um, I was going to add to that. I was just kind of reflecting on what you were saying. And I've been doing research at the moment. So this is raw data, not peer reviewed. Um, I've been interviewing young men about their experiences of sex and sexual intimacy and, and trying to get at how do they understand what's happening in the moment? What does that feel like? How do they know if something's going well or not going well? And what I re and I was kind of expecting them to kind of say that they needed verbal confirmation, that they, they really needed women to articulate needs. And what I found was that what I've been finding is a lot of them are very aware of body language and they're actually very aware of when body language is a no. And they're very aware of when things aren't going well. And so this, uh, this whole narrative, and I used to kind of believe this narrative that men don't know what's going on and they need more education. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think that's just not true. I think these men are very aware of what's happening in a sexual moment, they, they, they were able to describe to me what tense body looks like, what relaxed body, what interested might look like, what uninterested. So I think this, I think, and I don't know how to answer this other than I'm, a, I'm aware that I think young men or young heterosexuals, as gender men who I'm working with, are very aware. Um, and I'm starting to wonder, is it, is it to do with the fact that we very much devalue young cis women as well as transgender diverse people and queer people, like we devalue them so much in our society, and I'm thinking about, you were saying about justification, is that playing into the kind of ways in which we're experiencing um, really non-consensual experiences, really horrific experiences, sexual violence, because at the end of the day we're seen as lesser. Um, and we're, we're positioned as lesser. And then I was also thinking when you were saying a little bit about the kind of, well, that was disgusting and things. A lot of, I'm going to use young women as an example here, but a lot of young cis straight women are not taught or encouraged to articulate their needs. And so you were talking earlier about the romance of the man chasing. Mm -hmm. And part of that romance is that we're meant to say no. Uh, a lot. They're meant, we're meant to say no, we have to be coy, right? We have to be gatekeepers. If we say yes right away, we're sluts. So we can't do that, right? But if we constantly say no, where the Madonnas were frigid, we're not good at, like we have to balance this line between saying yes and saying no. And, and even when I reflect on my own experiences, it took me a very long time to get to a point where I felt comfortable and confident to articulate needs because I was so ingrained with this idea that I, I shouldn't be saying yes to something I wanna say yes to. And when I'm saying no, do I really mean no or do I not mean no? And and unfortunately, then it gets tangled up. Young men are being taught that no doesn't mean no, and young women are being taught that no means yo, no, and no means yes. And it's really challenging to break apart some of that. And so I don't have an answer other than we need to break some of those bigger things as well. And we need to, I, I would like to see us supporting young women, and this doesn't answer the sexual violence because I think the sexual violence issue is an issue of patriarchy and oppression and the ways in which we treat people. Mm -hmm. But I would love to see more encouragement for young women in particular to take ownership of their bodies and experiences and desires in ways that don't then put them, don't position them as shameful, doesn't use slut shaming language, um, and allows them for that exploration. I don't know if that answers, but mm. yeah. I, I, I'm nowhere out of time and I'm gonna get. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, just on that last comment, um, I was talking to a couple of female friends just last night about this, and both of them said, but if I say no, 
then what will happen to me? Yeah. And I think, you know, as empowering as it is, this idea that women can take control of their bodies and be like, no, like, both of these women said to me, well, sometimes you just have to give a pity fuck because, yeah. you know, you might not make it out. Because yeah. you're not safe. And, yeah. and, like, I was surprised that we didn't talk about gender more tonight, but also I wonder if we frame it through gender too much. Um, as a gay man, I know so many other gay men who have been beaten up by their partner or who have been raped or, you know, and I, I'm aware that within the queer community, um, family violence is high. Yeah. And yeah. it says to me it's not a gendered issue, not through, you can't purely view it through a gendered lens. Like, I wonder how much power needs to come into the conversation as well. Um, I took my boyfriend, we went to like a gay sauna. Yeah. I'm really tall, I never really think too much about my own safety. He's a lot shorter. On the way in, he looked me in the eyes with so much fear in his face and he said, Pat, please do not leave my side for the entire time we're here. Yeah. And I had never thought about how much he has preyed upon as a smaller person um, by men. And I don't know, it's just, I've been thinking about this a lot lately around, we, we frame it very much through a gendered lens, but is it really just about gender? Is it just about men and women? Like, or, or is it about, you know, coming back to that conversation about respect? Um, and, and, you know, why is sex a separate concept? And I, this is a question, sorry. That, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, why, why is sex a separate concept that needs to be educated about when it's actually just about human connection? Yeah, um, if we respect each other in the workplace, in school, in our families, then aren't we going to respect each other in bed? Um, say whatever you want. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I think that was... The, it's an excellent question and it's probably a really nice way to, to end. And it seems like we've actually gone from consent to respect and, mm. and maybe that's actually where... That's what we should be teaching. It's not about consent. Um, and we've probably worked worked her way around with your help. Um, That's Jerry there. Springer's final thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm just conscious of time and I'm, I, I'd like to maybe give everyone a final 30 seconds. I don't know why I'm looking at you, Palmer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's, 30 seconds because you guys have just been so extraordinary and I really, I've just been hanging on every word that you've all been saying this evening. So, Carmen, 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I also want to wrap up what you said. I think that's really interesting about gender and things like that. I think we all think gender is so constructed. And I, I've had a really interesting experience. I'll quickly tell you in 30 seconds. My, my, um, my son is autistic, um, my younger son. And so I've been able to work through sex education with my older son in a really different way. But we've really had to unpack things where gender, uh, and unpack gender really profoundly. Um, and it is all about power. I really do believe that, that, that we've got real power intersections in our society that are really foundationally the problem that we really need to address rather than sex and all, all of the tools and all of the things that we've got, phones and porn and whatever, are all just tools of our human problem with power. How's that? <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I agree. It is, I definitely agree about sometimes we have to get away a bit, away from the kind of binaries of gender mm -hmm. and actually look about where is the position of power within that, because you're absolutely right. You know, violence within the LGBTIQ plus community is rife, it, it, it's horrific, and it's really difficult to engage and address because it's already a very stigmatized and marginalized um, population group. And I know that artists were doing some work in that space to help actually provide support for that. So I agree, it is very much about power and we do need to shift the language to think about power and gender becomes part of that discussion, but as you've rightly noted, it shouldn't be the entire discussion. So, mm -hmm. absolute agreement with you. Yeah, same. Uh, my, my final thoughts, I think 
As, as a society, the acknowledgement that sex is a basic human drive that, that most of us have and the desire to have sex influences many of our decisions, probably too many for some people of our decisions, and this desire to, to uh, have a sexual interaction exists, right? So that, that's the first acknowledgement. And if you take that as a kind of given, that then, then the question around consent becomes around that being respectful. It also comes around uh, self-control. I think that, that, that is the kind of lessons within that. It's about respectful relationships. It's about self-control. It's around sexual communication. It's, it's around all of these things that sit around that and, and with the kind of underlying knowledge that uh, people want to get laid and that's kind of okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sex is still good.